Good news from South America this month. Ecuador marked the centenary of the 1917 Russian Revolution, if only subconsciously, by electing the radical candidate Lenin Moreno as its president. Those who had hoped that his opponent, the banker in love with tax havens, Guillermo Lasso, might continue on the trajectory of Paraguay, Brazil, and Argentina, were sorely disappointed. The people, especially the poor and the indigenous, celebrated and danced in the streets. Rafael Correa, the outgoing president, burst into song, singing an ode to Che Guevara. It was Correa's policies and the political and economic stability he created in bad times that ensured Lenin Moreno's victory. The right had united, and it was this that made it a narrow victory, but significant nonetheless. It's important to understand how important the last 10 years of political, social, and economic developments have been in making sure that Ecuador remains a Bolivarian Republic on the path which they had decided years ago with a new constitution and with the reforms. In 2013, Rafael Correa had defeated Lasso by winning 4.9 million votes. Lasso was then 2 million votes behind. This time, Lenin Moreno obtained 5 million votes, though Lasso had caught up and was on 4.8 million. The huge pressure on the Ecuadorian right to unite, not to fight each other, to come out and vote for Lasso, pressure which was exercised both from Washington and the local elite, led to this huge leap for the banker who managed for the first time to unite the divided right in the country. If the campaign fought by Lenin Moreno was vigorous, sharp, explaining what he was fighting for, it was greatly helped by the huge fall in unemployment that had taken place in Ecuador. It had fallen to 4.1% by the end of last year, a record low for at least 25 years. Poverty had fallen by 27% since 2006. Public spending on education had more than doubled in real inflation-adjusted terms. Increased healthcare spending meant that access to medical care was no longer confined to those with money. And other social spending also included a substantial and vast expansion of government-subsidized housing credit. People who believe that the only way forward is via neoliberalism, via a strictly uh, orthodox market economy, were extremely concerned at the state spending. But the state spending was crucial to lift a large layer of the population. The poorest sections of the country are the millions of indigenous people who live there, whose country it is, to lift them out of poverty. And this, the Rafael Correa governments prior to Lenin's uh, victory did year after year. It was a slow process, but it was extremely important. It was sustainable. Interest payments on Ecuador's public debt are less than 1% of GDP, which is quite small. In fact, very small compared to many European countries. And the public debt 
to GDP ratio is a modest 25%. Even newspapers like The Economist and other financial uh, rags like The Wall Street Journal, which don't much care for any of the government's policies, had to admit that Ecuador had managed to control the economy, to run it effectively, though they attributed Korea's success to a mixture of luck, opportunism, and skill. Luck didn't play too much of a part in this operation. It was skill and the fact that Rafael Correa himself was a trained economist who knew how the system functioned, how it could be used, how, in fact, it was possible, even within the overall capitalist economy, which rules the world and most of the countries uh, in it, that it was perfectly possible to operate within this system to push through certain reforms. This lesson, of course, has not been learned in, in parts of South America, uh, and, uh, of course, in most parts of uh, Europe and, and North America. But Ecuador, from that point of view, was a shining example as to what could be done. It is said that people don't care much about equality any longer. This is not true. It is just that they see equality not simply in terms of equal amounts of money, but they see it in terms of equal amounts of facilities. They want the same facilities that are enjoyed by others. They want free medicine, free health, free education, because this they can't afford to pay in order to get the best of it. The government also had to reform and re-regulate the financial system. And here one has to say that what they did is probably the most meaningful and comprehensive financial reform of any country in the 21st century. This is a huge claim, but it is a fact. What did they do? In an epoch in which neoliberal governments have been saying that we have to make the central bank independent, i.e. independent from the government and independent from the state, but not independent from other banks and bankers and people with huge amounts of money. So, in fact, the so-called independence of the central banks in various countries does help a particular type of person and people. And that's why they were made independent, to reassure the tycoons and the oligarchs and the hedge fund owners, we're working in your interests. Now, Rafael Correa did something very remarkable. He took control, or rather the government took control over the central bank, and forced it to bring back two billion of reserves held abroad. This was then used by the public banks to make loans for infrastructure, housing, agriculture, other domestic investments. And if it can be done in Ecuador, the question arises, why not in different parts of the world, which is still struggling to come out of the 2008 crisis? Why don't the financial institutions, the US Treasury Department, the European leaders, uh, in serious trouble now, follow these measures? Of course, it will decrease the profits of some, but it will enhance the life and living conditions and values of a large majority of the population. Another thing the government did was to put a tax on money leaving the country. And it insisted that banks had to keep 
60% of their liquid assets inside the country. It pushed real interest rates down while bank taxes were increased. The government then went on to make agreements unhappily for the foreign oil companies when prices rose. As a result, government revenue rose from 27% of GDP in 2006 to over 40% in 2016. Within 10 years, the Korea administration had increased funding to the popular and solidarity part of the financial sector, cooperatives, credit unions, other number-based organizations, loans tripled in real terms to co-ops between 2007 and 2012. The result of all this was that the financial sector was regulated and forced against its will to serve the interests of the public instead of the other way around. And economists in the United States, progressive economists like Mark Weisbrot, extremely knowledgeable on South America in particular and elsewhere, has argued that the success of the government in separating the financial structure, the financial sectors, from the media, the banks had till now owned a large majority, about 85%, possibly more, of the major media networks before Korea was elected and introduced antitrust reforms. The other thing which is worth stressing again and again, that between 1996 and 2005, no Ecuadorian president managed to finish his term. They were toppled. There was large-scale social mobilizations. They were corrupt to the core. This political instability created panic, actually, in amongst all layers of society. There was talk of possible military intervention, there was unease, there, were, uh, there was a danger of Ecuador becoming an extremely authoritarian republic, and all the people who were, in fact, booted out by popular anger and had to run or hide were backed by the country's media. I, I remember when I visited Ecuador some years ago, being astonished at the complete and utter bias of the Ecuadorian media, worse even than its counterparts in Venezuela and Bolivia. It was one of the most corrupt press and media organizations I have seen. Even the American ambassador to the country was a bit taken aback by how appalling the media was. The release of 3,000 WikiLeaks cables on Ecuador revealed the anger of the American embassy. The, the press was totally corrupt. They were only out to do one thing, harm the government. That was all. A February 2009 cable from the U.S. Embassy in Quito stated that Korea had, with some justification, painted the media as aligned with the country's political and business elite and therefore an obstacle to the changed agenda of the citizens' revolution, while noting that the private media has shown solidarity in defending themselves against the attacks and continues to report and comment critically on Korea and his government. When the media barons went to call on the U.S. ambassador to complain that Korea was threatening press freedom, they were told in private by the ambassador that they should stop telling such lies. So, here we have a situation where what the Americans say in public is critical of the Korea regime, but they are shocked 
completely taken aback by how the Ecuadorian media is operating because they see it as counterproductive. A decade of left government in Ecuador included many, many changes which made possible the victory of Lenin Moreno. Because people don't forget, they don't have short memories. They know when a government is competent. They know perfectly well that prior to Korea, there was a huge period of instability in, in Ecuador. Mass uprisings got rid of corrupt governments. And so the reduction in poverty, if you look at the figures, they are quite impressive. An overall 38% reduction in poverty and a 47% reduction in extreme poverty. And this is something very different to any other um, country which still operates a neoliberal system and will not challenge it in the rest of the continent. The fact that social spending doubled, the fact that there were large increases in spending on education and health care cannot be ignored. I mean, we have now a situation where Ecuadorian children from working class and poor families, and in fact all children, do not have to pay for school, do not have to pay for higher education. In other words, university entry is free for those who qualify to enter these universities. Probably the most, one of the most effective reforms that took place was the huge changes in education policies, uh, in giving credit for cheap housing, in building houses at cheap prices. But higher education affects the entire country and is one way of dragging large numbers of people out of poverty, breaking that cycle of poverty. In the old days, it used to be said that higher education was free, but in fact, the investment in higher education prior to uh, uh, Korea was very low and they charged fees. So public education was never free at the level of the universities. And of course, the best schools were private schools where uh, rich kids who paid. It's the same all over most parts of the world now. In a country like Ecuador, it seemed much, much uh, larger. So these reforms, which were embedded in the 2008 Constitution, made it clear that higher education should be absolutely free. And the results on this level have been extraordinary. The enrollment rates for indigenous and Afro-Ecuadorians have been rising at a huge level, and 15,000 of the over 200,000 entering university in 2016 came from households that received the Bona de Deserralo Humano, a government transfer for low-income families. This was not created by the Korea government, but they improved it technically and put in huge amounts of money. And this is now, of course, beginning to make a big difference in relation to poverty and in changing conditions for large numbers of indigenous and black students uh, in the country who were completely ignored. In other words, the political system is being democratized, has been democratized, education has been democratized. And the second dimension of the education reform is, of course, quality. The kids are now not sitting there to use up the taxes paid by uh, society, and they're being preparing to transform the education system themselves. They are talked to. The new organic law on higher education 
that introduce national entrance exams. These were designed to test attitudes rather than knowledge, so poor students from bad institutions have the same chance of passing as rich ones. The importance of this law and the importance of introducing assessments of the quality of education in the universities began to have its effect and continues to do so. And it's difficult even for the opposition to criticize these particular things, though they do, because it's obvious that it's the best possible thing that could be done. The education enrollment increased sharply for the 17-year-olds and under, and the spending on higher education as a percentage of GDP became the highest in Latin America. Average annual income growth per capita was much higher than for the preceding quarter of a century, 1.5 versus 0.6 percent, and inequality was reduced. What this goes to show is that these were not simply measures on paper. These were actually implemented. Hence, the popularity of the Peace Alliance, which despite huge attacks from without, especially the United States, and within by the elites representing Washington's interests, couldn't defeat Lenin Moreno in this campaign. Now, what will be the impact of Lenin Moreno's triumph in the Ecuadorian elections as the new president? First, it will stop talk of treating in a fatalistic way what is happening or what has happened in other parts of South America. Um, in Brazil, and before that in Paraguay, we had a constitutional coup carried out by the parliament against elected presidents. The reforming government, weak though it was in Argentina, was defeated by a neoliberal millionaire, billionaire, who is now in trouble himself. Lenin Moreno's victory in Ecuador will also provide a huge impetus to the rest of the continent, saying we're still here, we're fighting back, and if you can create political and economic stability based on huge social reforms, you can do it too. It's a very meaningful result in that way. Given Trump's election, and the war of words being waged against Mexico, more money being put into the building, this so-called wall that will divide Mexico from the West Coast, uh, means that there's great anger which keeps growing each day in Mexico itself. And a progressive candidate, Lopez Obrador, denied the presidency by open ballot rigging at least on one occasion is poised now, ahead in the opinion polls, to come to power in Mexico. And a progressive president in Mexico would make a big difference to the continent, to the South American continent, and of course to the North American one too, because it's the bridge between the two. And so Lenin Moreno's victory in a small country like Ecuador has huge symbolic and political significance. Moreno's triumph also means that the program of the Peace Alliance will be maintained on every level, both domestic and foreign. So those who were imagining that with the manufactured defeat of Dilma Rousseff in Brazil and their victory of the neoliberal banking elite in Argentina, all was finished, were wrong. 
a lot is still there to play for. The pink tide has been temporarily reversed in some countries, but not in all. And Lenin Moreno's victory also provides us with a very interesting contrast with the United States, though many Americans will be shocked by this contrast. But I ask you this, how come that Barack Obama, whose ratings were very high when he left, could not deliver a victory for his own political party? in the United States of America, while Rafael Correa, whose ratings were also high, could deliver a victory for his successor in Ecuador. In the case of Obama, we can say many things. We can say that primar uh, basically the candidate chosen by the Democrats was not viable. That, of course, is a major factor. That can explain the presidential election. Added to that, you have the loss of the Senate and the House of Representatives as well. That can't simply be blamed on Clinton. That is to be blamed on Obama, who put into motion Obamacare or a health act that was deeply flawed so that even Democrats fighting the election felt that uh, they couldn't defend it. Instead of going, obviously, for a free, at the point of production, so to speak, i.e. everyone who went in was entitled to free medicine, creating a national health service, he mixed it up, he created a very high level of bureaucracy, and that was the only serious reform he tried to push through and succeeded in, but it hasn't worked. On, a, on the level that they were hoping it would work for. On all other fronts, Obama basically carried out Bush's policies in relation to Wall Street, no regulation, no serious attempt to bring these corrupt bankers to trial, as was done in Iceland or even Spain. And the result is you have the election of Donald Trump. Crazy to blame Trump's victory purely on his own abilities. This is not the case. There was a huge vacuum created in the states where large numbers of people who had voted for Obama in critical states felt that they had gained nothing, who now turned to Trump. This didn't happen in Ecuador. And it didn't happen because the reforms pushed through with popular backing with a new constitution by Rafael Correa in the period he was in office, created and left a huge impact on the population which responded in kind. The vote for Lenin Moreno did not go down. It actually rose a bit compared to the votes for Rafael Correa. The right unified, still failed to defeat him, though the country remains uh, uh, divided. But there is a lot, a lot still to play for. And on Lenin Moreno now rests the burden of making sure that the program of the Peace Alliance of progressive politics in South America is taken forward.